and thank you for joining us for this Flinders University Brave event, Brave New Virtual World, Gaming and Problem Gaming in the Age of COVID-19. I'm Karen Ashford, your host for this evening, as we explore how stay-at-home lifestyles and lockdowns during COVID-19 have not only changed the way we work, but the way we relax. On phones, tablets, computers and TV screens around the, around the globe, online gaming has boomed. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we're hosting tonight's forum on the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge the elders of all the nations upon which Flinders reaches and teaches. Tonight's event is delivered as part of our Brave lecture series. Why Brave? Well, through this series, we showcase our researchers who challenge the status quo and bravely investigate with a view to resolve some of the big societal challenges of our time. This series is supported by our valued presenting partner, Bank SA. Tonight, we're fortunate to be hearing from Flinders researcher and clinical psychologist, Associate Professor Daniel King. Joining him in the second half for our panel discussion is Dr. Kim Lee, a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist specialising in internet gaming disorder. Katie Kavanagh, course coordinator and lecturer in Flinders Bachelor of Creative Arts, Visual Effects and Entertainment Design. And Dan Thorsland, business development manager within Flinders College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences. But before we hear from Daniel, I'd like to remind the audience that if you're unable to stay with us for the duration of tonight's event, you can watch our recording later via our website, flinders.edu.au. As always, we're keen to make this an interactive event with a real live Q&A session. It's your chance to participate in the discussion and to pose questions in real time. We do ask, however, that everyone treats this forum with respect and that we treat each other with dignity and tolerate different views. Now we're ready to start receiving your questions online now via Slido. So go to www.slido.com and enter the event code hashtag BraveOct21. You can also join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag BraveResearch. So it's now my pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Associate Professor Daniel King. Daniel's research focuses on understanding and responding to digital technology-based problems, particularly those relating to online gaming and simulated gambling. He has more than 150 publications on these topics, including the first book on internet gaming disorder as classified in the DSM-5, that's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, and has received funding from the Australian Research Council to study maladaptive gaming. Daniel has provided consultation on gaming and gambling for national and international authorities, including for the World Health Organization's International Classification of Diseases, 11th edition. I invite Associate Professor Daniel King to begin this evening's conversation. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to be part of this uh, diverse panel. The topic of problem gaming uh, has been uh, a subject of international interest for longer than I've been alive. If we look at this article from November 1982, the US Surgeon General uh, highlighted problem gaming as an issue facing the young people of the US. And in preparing for this talk, I was reminded of some very good advice I received at the beginning of my research career, which was beware of extreme views. Beware of extreme viewpoints. And the, uh, the study of problem gaming has often been um, characterised by very strong opposing views. On the one hand, that problems can arise from excessive gaming, but on the other hand, that some people play games and experience various benefits. And sometimes this has led to some faulty generalisations about gaming, like if gaming can be bad for you, then gaming cannot be good for you. Or, on the other hand, if gaming can be good for you, then gaming cannot be bad for you. And I'd like to propose a balanced alternative view that gaming can have both good and bad effects on players under certain conditions. So 
a substantial um, development, a really significant development a few years ago was the World Health Organization recognized gaming disorder in the international classification of diseases. And this is a disorder that shares many characteristics with gambling disorder. It's characterized by impaired control over gaming, uh, uh, overprioritization of gaming, and functional impairment related to excessive gaming. And we conducted a meta-analysis of problem gaming uh, and gaming disorder, and we found that if you look across about 50 studies around the world, that about 1%, 1 to 2% of the population uh, meet the criteria for problem gaming and gaming disorder. But there's a lot of variability in the way that we uh, measure problem gaming. But uh, there is consistent evidence that uh, problem gaming does exist and does affect a small minority of players. The WHO decision to include gaming disorder in the ICD-11 was met with some resistance from uh, some researchers, but particularly from the gaming industry. They released a statement uh, that I've presented here uh, highlighting some of the benefits of gaming to argue against the inclusion of gaming disorder in the ICD-11. And the gaming uh, industry is multifaceted, it's highly complex, and it's evolved a lot over time. It's been around for many decades, and it's become a multi-billion dollar industry. And in recent years, it's uh, been particularly profitable in the areas of mobile gaming, or sometimes called free-to-play gaming. An important point to understand gaming is that gaming is not one single thing and usually doesn't involve only gaming. When people play games, they typically will be listening to music or checking their phone. Uh, they might also be browsing the internet at the same time. Uh, they may also be on social media. Or they may be watching videos or simply talking among their friends. It can sometimes be a place, a virtual world, for people to uh, act out various behaviours, connect with people, and do many different things. And that presents a lot of challenges for research in how we measure gaming. Gaming is also highly diverse. There are many different types of games. There are shooting games, role-playing games, um, and some games that will leverage many of these characteristics and features to um, create hybrids. And perhaps the most popular game at the moment is Fortnite, which incorporates a lot of these sorts of elements and, and has hundreds of millions of players worldwide. To understand gaming too, we need to recognise that it's constantly evolving that there are a lot of innovations in the technology, like virtual reality, augmented reality, that uh, many people play games as a way of connecting with other people to reach many uh, thousands of people in their audience. Uh, games also provide a lot of tools for identity development and expression. And I think importantly to a discussion around problem gaming, we should recognise that uh, games have also become increasingly monetized that they incorporate some features that look a bit like gambling, like loot boxes and various other microtransaction elements. So what's happening in Australia in relation to policy on problem gaming? Uh, what are we recognising? If we look 10 years ago, we can see uh, the Joint Select Committee on Cyber Safety published this report called High Wire Act, Cyber Safety and the Young. And a major focus of that report was really on elements like privacy and online bullying. But the report also highlighted some emerging concerns around technology addictions. And some of the practical solutions that were put forward 10 years ago in Australia were primarily around filtering, around um, preventing people from accessing certain content. And many of these proposed solutions were, were seen to be impractical or not feasible. If we compare our situation to Germany, I often say that Australia is about eight hours ahead of Europe, but we're about 10 years behind when it comes to problem, addressing problem gaming. The national strategy and policy published in Germany about 10 years ago recognised online and media addictions as um, an area of public interest and set about uh, highlighting the need for greater epidemiological research, uh, for recognising uh, the need for consumer advice around gaming and also treatment for problem gamers. Another important report that came out through the Office of the eSafety Commissioner is the State of Play report, which came out in 2018, uh, which highlights some Australian data on youth engagement 
with various online technologies, including gaming. And this report highlighted that online gaming is a very prevalent activity, that there are many players who experience bullying, but the report didn't go into detail on gaming time or problems related to excessive gaming. The eSafety Commissioner does, however, recognise uh, various risks of gaming on the eSafety uh, Commissioner website, uh, including elements around bullying, uh, inappropriate content, but as you can see at the bottom of the list, we have spending too much time online. And there is some information, um, some limited information on the website around what to do if your child might be spending too much time playing games. I also found on the website uh, a lot of information about the games themselves, including the sort of content that you might find in those games, uh, where you can buy the games, and their relationship to esports. Uh, another significant and important report that was uh, uh, put out by the Australian Communications and Media Authority is the Digital Lives of Younger Australians report, which was a companion to another report on the digital lives of older Australians. And this included a survey of 18 to 34 year olds um, documenting really the involvement of young people in online technologies. Gaming, however, was not identified in this report. So the report identified that during COVID-19, during the early stages of the pandemic, around March, April 2020, that there was a large increase in the number of people who were spending time watching videos, participating in social media, uh, browsing the internet, online shopping, but no data on gaming. Uh, the, the most information we have from uh, about gaming participation in Australia uh, comes from the uh, Digital Australia report, which is put out by the uh, IGEA, which is the uh, peak uh, industry association representing gaming in Australia. And these reports have been put out pretty consistently over the last 15 years. And they highlight that younger people tend to spend more time playing games than older people. And in particular, we see uh, males aged 15 to 24 spend on average about two hours a day playing games. The report, however, doesn't highlight issues around excessive gaming. The best available data that we have on problem gaming and the extent to which gaming intersects with mental health comes from uh, the Mental Health of Children and Adolescents report, which was published uh, nearly six years ago now. And this is a study that highlights that among young males, that around 4% of um, male adolescents are spending nine hours on gaming every day. Um, the report also uh, reports on uh, problem gaming in this particular population and found that when you look at uh, some indicators of problem gaming, like not eating or drinking, feeling unable to stop playing, playing despite problems, that around 4% of young men are, are meeting these criteria. And uh, so, we, so we know based on this information that around 4% of young males are reporting problem gaming. We also conducted a study uh, back in 2013 where we approached uh, various schools in Adelaide and we asked uh, students about problem gaming and we found that about 1.8% were uh, meeting the criteria for problem gaming, about 6% reported problem internet use, and around 3% were meeting both criteria. And males tended to be more at risk by a factor of four for these sorts of problems, and they, they were correlated with all kinds of um, psychological um, conditions, mood problems, uh, like feeling more anxious or depressed, feeling lonely, and less socially capable. So how has gaming changed in the context of COVID-19? Well, industry leaders recognise that although many businesses were struggling during the early stages of the pandemic and continue to, it was a time of prosperity for the gaming industry. And many of the predictions that were put out at the beginning of the pandemic said this is a time for the industry to really thrive. And to a large extent, they've been accurate predictions. So the Australian gaming industry has grown to $3.4 billion amid COVID-19. And we know that gaming consumption in Australia has increased by 24% since COVID-19 uh, in the context of a global increase of around 36%, which is quite a, a large 
um, a boom for the industry comparable to perhaps the online gaming boom in the early 2000s or the console boom in the 90s. And people were spending a lot of money during COVID-19 in the early stages uh, on consoles. There was about 150% increase in sales on gaming uh, hardware. And if we look to some of the most popular games during the pandemic, there was a game about a pandemic that was very popular, uh, a game about global conflict uh, and a game about uh, dystopian future. But perhaps the most popular game or noteworthy example was Animal Crossing, which was a game that with more sort of cute graphics and whimsy uh, that sold around 13 million copies uh, when it released at the beginning of the pandemic, which kind of fueled this narrative that people wanted to escape from the harsh realities of that they were facing. Also some evidence that there was a 30% increase in time spent on fighting games at the beginning of the pandemic too. So we have quite a lot of mixed evidence in this area. Um, industry data suggests that there is a growth in the number of serious gamers, people who will spend at least five hours per week on games through the pandemic and that are expected to be retained um, after the pandemic subsides. And a curious um, development during the early stages of the pandemic was uh, the industry recommending gaming at home in conjunction with adhering to the WHO's uh, public health guidelines around um, social distancing, and that was supported by the WHO. It did, however, lead to some unusual headlines like the WHO is recommending gaming despite recognising gaming disorder um, and statements like no one thought that during the pandemic, the WHO would recommend gaming as a pastime activity. It would seem to be incompatible with this idea of problem gaming that you would also recommend gaming as a form of uh, safety. But the WHO also released its own guidelines on uh, excessive screen use and gaming, um, advocating for playing in moderation, balancing with offline activities, and setting clear rules on screen time. But what does the academic research say about gaming during lockdown and COVID? Well, this study out of Germany um, surveyed a large group of, of regular gamers and found that over half of gamers were spending um, a bit more time playing games and around one in five gamers were spending a lot more time in games. So consistent with the industry data. Uh, in this study um, conducted in the US and the UK, uh, it was found that among those people who increased the amount of time they were spending playing games, there was an associated increase in problem gaming symptoms. Uh, this study out of Japan highlighted that uh, following people from before the pandemic and into the pandemic, that the prevalence of problem gaming increased from 2.5% to 4.1%. And again, it was males, typically younger males, who were more at risk of experiencing that increase. Uh, this study out of Korea highlighted that when you compare different groups of gamers, those who are casual gamers, some who are perhaps low risk problem gamers, and then those who are uh, meeting those gaming disorder uh, criteria, that the problem gamers experienced the largest increase in their gaming time by a factor of three compared to other gamer subtypes. I'll skip these. So the question arises, is it the player or is it the game? And the answer is it's really both. And we have evidence that um, there are certain player vulnerabilities, certain aspects of people who, that make them more susceptible to developing problem gaming habits. Uh, they tend to be more impulsive. Uh, they might have some pre-existing issues like social anxiety, depression, or attention issues, uh, difficulties with regulating emotion, or deficits in executive control. People who aren't generally um, uh, scoring well on decision-making tasks and things like this. But what about the games? To what extent are the games related to problem gaming? How do they contribute to the issue? Uh, we have evidence to suggest that certain larger, more endless, more complex, random uh, rewards uh, in games are associated with problem gaming and games that have um, social features that often set about social obligations to play and expectation on a player to always follow a routine with their friends are associated with excessive gaming. But I'd like to focus on the issue of monetization because I think it's increasingly important to understanding problem gaming 
particularly in, re in relation to mobile gaming. So we understand that traditional game design would often be about um, the player developing mastery through skill or knowledge over the game. Through more practice, you become better, you're able to predict the in-game events, you can test theories about what will make you successful in the game and generally get better over time. Now, I think this has been turned on its head by uh, mobile gaming. And mobile gaming, I should say, by the way, is incredibly uh, popular. Uh, if we look at the top 100 games on Google Play and Apple Marketplaces, we see that about 60% of these games have these monetization features like loot boxes. Um, and what makes these games different? Well, they use a number of different techniques that encourage players to spend money. And this picture I've put up here highlights just one of these things, and that is that the currency within the game, the opportunities to spend money, are not always converted into intuitive amounts. If you spend $5.50, you might get 500 gems. But if you then spend $8.49, you might get 900 gems. It makes it very difficult for people to keep track of how much money they're spending. And we developed this term predatory monetization, and it refers to a series of schemes or in-game purchasing systems that uh, disguise or withhold the long-term cost of the activity. And it's, uh, often in, it often involves encouraging players to spend um, repeatedly using various tactics in the game. Things like not disclosing everything about the in-game um, purchasing offer or providing misleading um, information about the value of items or how random something might be. And these are systems that fundamentally exploit inequalities in information between the purchaser and the provider. And it looks a bit like this. So in a traditional game, the more time you spend, the more information you have about the game, the better you're going to perform. In a free-to-play game, the more time and money you invest in the game, the more information that the game provider has about you and can leverage against you in order to spend more money. And this is evident when we look at some of the utility patents that have been developed in games. This one, for example, uh, refers to a system in a game that adjusts the likelihood of rewards based on how much money you've spent and how much credit you have available. So it's tracking information about the player to present offers in the game that it knows you're more likely to spend money on. And the emerging literature in this area, based on this meta-analysis of 15 studies, suggests there are consistent links between participation in and spending on these features and problem gambling symptoms. So problem gaming and the gaming industry. I think the gaming industry has been, um, has tried to stay a little bit distant to the issue of problem gaming for a long time. This is a statement from 2012 where uh, Blizzard Entertainment, the uh, publisher behind the game World of Warcraft, which at the time had a large uh, number of problem gamers uh, identified in some studies, said it's never our intent for our players to play our games to the exclusion of other activities. It's ultimately up to the individual or his or her parents. So a kind of diffusion of responsibility. But the industry, I think, over time has taken further steps to uh, give people tools and information about the product, like age classification systems, though these tend to refer to things like violence or other kinds of uh, content that uh, relates to community concerns uh, and safety guidelines, though typically around um, posture and, and the way in which you would actually use the hardware. There are parental controls for gaming. Uh, it's unclear um, how this, um, these particular tools relate to um, the prevention of problem gaming, but they are available. And again, as I said before, the gaming industry has, uh, has taken a fairly strong stance in, the, into, in, in relation to problem gaming and gaming disorder in the ICD-11. Um, presenting this video, for example, uh, saying that, well, based on what some academics have said, the good news for parents is that the concerns may be unfounded. Uh, other organisations like UNICEF are starting to look into social responsibility in games and they've prepared uh, this report with recommendations for the online gaming industry for assessing the kinds of negative impacts that their products may have on players. And we developed a social responsibility blueprint 
uh, some time ago about uh, microtransactions. What might be some of the important things that the industry could look into to make their products safer? Things like the way in which the game is designed, how transparent information is in the game. So you know what you're getting when you put money into the game and you can get a refund or you can have access to a, a record of how much money you've spent over a longer period of time. Many of these sorts of measures have been implemented in gambling. And in terms of uh, this problem in Australia, what do Australian and New Zealand psychiatrists think? So there was a large uh, survey of this population about four years ago uh, that found that about 60% of psychiatrists agreed that uh, gaming disorder was a mental health problem and about 80% uh, believed it was possible to be addicted to uh, non-gaming content like social media. And if we look to the UK, we can see that the National Health Service opened up a clinic to help uh, problem gamers uh, uh, back in uh, 2019. And during lockdowns, the referrals to this clinic uh, tripled. So that there seemed to be some relationship between uh, the public need around problem gaming and the lockdown conditions. And we see many of these sorts of stories in Australia too, around uh, families that are seeking support for uh, problem gaming, looking for a treatment provider, uh, and often finding that there is a large gap between the public need and what is actually available in the community to address the issue. And in terms of the treatment evidence, we're still really developing in this area. Um, it's quite mixed. It often has um, a number of limitations. We are in uh, there's a strong need for more clinical trials, um, particularly in Australia, where we haven't actually conducted any of these just yet. And a lot of this stems from, I think, many of these issues from the lack of funding to address the problem. Uh, we look at the um, ARC and NHMRC schemes, they have success rates of around 8 to 13%. And if you indulge this pop culture reference, it's more difficult to get this funding than it is to pass any given round in Squid Game. Even the glass bridge. Um, now I want to finish by acknowledging gamers' perspectives on this issue too, that we've asked gamers and we can learn so much from the gaming community who have a num number of very useful insights into uh, gaming products and what can be done. And we surveyed about 600 of uh, the members of the gaming community about their particular attitudes towards different um, prevention and intervention um, uh, sort of measures that could be taken. And generally they were very supportive of school-based education, of healthy gaming guidelines, um, it, it's supportive of outpatient treatment options, though less supportive of things like um, involuntary time limits on games and policies that require time restrictions on games like we've seen recently in China. So in summary, gaming is widely enjoyed and has benefits for many players. And these benefits include social aspects, uh, uh, problem solving, creativity. But problem gaming is also a mental health issue that's been recognized by the WHO and by the American Psychiatric Association. And these two statements should not be seen as um, incompatible. We can recognize the, both the benefits and the problems. It's a problem that affects a small proportion of players. We think around one to 2%. Um, which would be consistent with estimates for problem gambling, but also for a range of other mental health conditions. Um, and male adolescents and other psychologically vulnerable individuals uh, report much higher rates, around 4%. We're starting to understand that there, all games are different and there are some features in games that are associated with greater risk of problem gaming. And in particular, we're seeing that in relation to microtransactions. Uh, the pandemic has had, uh, uh, I think, uh, produced an economic boon for the industry with both positive and negative implications, particularly in, for those negative implications for problem gamers in lockdown. In Australia, there's very limited policy recognition, very limited research support and treatment when we compare uh, ourselves to other developed countries like Switzerland, Germany, the Netherlands, uh, the US, the UK, we're really lagging behind. And I think in order for 
uh, us to make progress in this area, we really need to um, develop our policy, but also our interventions to help target these harmful player game interactions while acknowledging that players um, you know, can also use these games in a healthy way and we don't need to introduce measures that detract from the fundamental enjoyment of games. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dan, for that really quite comprehensive insight into the vast world of, of gaming. Um, we're starting to receive a few questions, uh, so if you'd like to take part in person, please make your way to the central microphone. If you're online, visit slido.com and enter the event code hashtag braveopt2021, and that is hashtag B-R-A-V-E-O-C-T-2021. So as we get the discussion started, I'd just like to introduce our three experts so you know who we're speaking with today. Dr. Kim Lee is an Adelaide child and adolescent psychiatrist specialising in video gaming addiction or gaming disorder. He provides a completely online telepsychiatry service CGI clinic offering gaming disorder assessment and management plans to Australian patients up to the age of 25. In 2015, Kim gave a TEDx talk at the Adelaide Town Hall titled The Spell of Digital Immersion. He has an SBS On Demand documentary film, Are You Addicted to Technology?, which was released in 2021. Thanks for joining us, Kim. Katie Kavanagh, next in line. She grew up in Los Altos, California, while Silicon Valley was still emerging as a digital hub. She majored and completed honours in English and was a sculpture major for three years at the North Adelaide School of Art. After graduating, she worked as a graphic designer, web monkey, and project manager for TechWorks and TMP Worldwide. She currently lectures in hands-on digital media topics where she happily frolics and explores the convergence and combination of text, design, image and meaning. Katie coordinates the visual effects and entertainment design degree where game art is an embedded stream within the degree. And last but certainly not least, Dan Thorsland has more than 35 years as a creative industries practitioner, first as a comic book writer and editor at DC Comics and Dark Horse Comics in the US, then transitioning to digital storytelling on his arrival in South Australia. So from 2001 to 2019, Dan produced a large portfolio of video games and other digital projects for major brand partners such as Atari, LucasArts, Disney and Lego. Not shabby, Dan, that's for sure. <laughs> Dan manages the university's motion capture and virtual production stage, The Void. It's the focal point of Flinders' acclaimed screen and performance programs, aligning with state-of-the-art industry technology to explore the future of immersive culture and narrative. So thank you, Kim, Katie and Dan, for joining us, Daniel and myself, tonight for this panel. So to get the discussion started, I'd actually like to turn to Kim for the first question. So Kim, in your work helping young people to overcome their gaming addictions, are there any key characteristics or early warning signs that parents should be on the lookout for that might give them an indication that there's a problem at, at hand? You know, what, what should they have their yeah. eyes Yeah, In 2015, I went to Singapore to work in video gaming addiction clinics and we published a commentary uh, looking at the statistics of the children seeking help for video gaming addiction. And on average, they were spending 45 hours per week playing their video games. And I'm explaining to the young people that I see that 45 hours per week is like working a full-time job. And then some. And then some. And, you know, it, it, this idea that it's a game has really evolved over time. And really the kids that I'm seeing this year are the ones that have gone through the pandemic. They're really just telling me that these are like essentially virtual theme parks where they just hang out and just spend all day there. It's more than just a game. It's a, it's a place where they meet and just be silly and have fun. And to me, it's, it's really concerning because these, you know, virtual Disneylands, they don't close. And I have to try and explain to them that the only people that spend all their time there are the people that work there. So it's something that, you know, always trying to explain to kids and their families. Is there an issue though where in some respects kids are actually more savvy when it comes to the digital environment, they're digital natives and are they ahead of their parents in how they then navigate those landscapes? Yeah. And what can parents do in that regard? I think the digital natives thing really annoys me because it, it kind of um, implies that people like Dan with expert you know, he, he doesn't know as much as his, his child and, you know, whether the digital, was it migrants? Is it immigrants? Because we didn't grow up with it. Um, and so it kind of detracts from these, this, this truth that really 
the internet and the platforms and the games around it are all actually owned by the people who create them, the, the tech companies, the Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, big corporate um, industries. So it, yeah, that, that uh, digital natives um, spin, I think, um, confuses a lot of parents that somehow their child knows more than them. Mm. But of course, you know, they, they do spend a lot of time in these virtual worlds. And, and as a psychiatrist, I, I try to um, explore that world with them and, and see what is so fascinating about those worlds for them. So perhaps Daniel and Kim, you might together like to consider what schools can be doing in this space. What role might they play in, in regards to how they can monitor and help manage the gaming activities of children? If I can go back to the first question about <clears throat> warning signs, something that's really important to recognise with problem gaming is that it's not necessarily about the amount of time you're spending. A lot of the research we've done has highlighted that when you look at the how much time a person spends and how to what extent they endorse some of those criteria I put up, the relationship's only around 0.3. Mm -hmm. So it's very small. So there are some people who can spend a lot of time in games and experience absolutely no problems whatsoever. And then people who might spend, you know, a, a small amount uh, to some um, mm -hmm. standards and it have a, a negative impact on their life. So when we talk about problem gaming, it's about uh, it's not about how much you, you think about games or how much you play games. It's about the extent to which you're losing control over how much time you spend um, and the extent to which it's actually having a negative impact on your life. So without those, those key elements, a person is not a problem gamer. They might just be someone who's very healthily engaged or passionate or whatever term you want to use. They're not a problem gamer. So I've been contacted by a lot of schools but particularly by school students and mm. I've had um, I, I often do interviews with particularly males uh, around you know 15 who are starting to ask these questions they're starting to recognize the difference between healthy play and problem play and I think what schools can do is um, support that conversation support that discussion among students because they are thinking about it they're aware of this issue uh, and Get, getting, making it interactive. It's got to be interactive for young people to care. Mm. So what I just gave was probably not of any interest to most young people. Mm. But if we can have a conversation to bring them in and, and get them to, to really reflect on what are the things about myself that are, uh, you know, vulnerable in terms of playing longer than I really want to, and what are the elements of games that, you know, I think might make me play too much, and start that critical thinking process because without insight, there's going to be very little change. So can the schools have a role in that, in terms of that identification and also the management aspect of it? Because there's that line where some say it's a parental responsibility. So what role do schools actually have? And are there lines that can't be overstepped or is, you know, is there... Yeah, I mean, I, I speak to a lot of schools um, because, you know, the child says, I need my laptop back, I need the Wi-Fi turned mm -hmm. back on, I need to do my homework. And, uh, you know, it's a negotiation process. You know, some schools, they'll, they'll set up a, a homework club for the, for the child to, to do their homework um, at mm -hmm. school or provide homework to their parents and, and email it to the parents and hard copies rather than having to, to do their homework online. So it's how you actually navigate the, the actual technical landscape for, for an outcome as much as it is, as it is the psychological factor by the sounds of things. Yeah, and, and to also realise that... Um, you know, we, we, we're sort of selling this idea that, you know, technology is great for learning and there's no proof that if, if you give a child uh, a laptop that they'll, they'll go to the educational websites. If a child doesn't know how to read or write in the first place, they'll go straight to a video game because you don't need to necessarily know how to read to play a video game. You just have to click a button. Great. Now, we do have a question from, uh, from a viewer. Uh, Tina, recently we've seen the resurgence in massively multiplayer online role-playing games, the MMORPG. In some games, there are players who turn the, in their games, sorry, to turn their in-game housing into cafes for others to hang out in. So thoughts about that? If you've got somebody who's in a game and then they've created a space for others to come and hang out, is that something that's likely to be healthy, or is, could that be a catalyst for for, for problems? Who'd like to take that one? <laughs> Can I do a clinical scenario? I mean, yeah. we're talking about you know accommodation or housing. I, I saw a, an, an adult patient last week. I, I consulted for a, a hospital in Perth. Um, this gentleman, um, 
he was in a team and they play a game where they um, build a base and every week the base gets wiped out and you've got to start from scratch. So 5am nice. at a particular time, they all are online rebuilding that base. And, um, yeah. you know, there's a blurring of uh, boundaries mm. and enmeshment um, in terms of what's real and what's virtual. And this particular game, I, I just learned this from speaking with the person, it, they actually have an app where it notifies you if someone's attacking your base. So if you leave the game, you never really stop, you never really stop playing the game because the game's still going on. It'll notify you and then alert you to jump back online to protect your base. So there's a real issue here with disengagement and being able to manage if you're being constantly prompted and dragged into it. You, you can't, can't escape. escape. In, and um, you know, my colleagues in Japan, they say that video gaming addiction is the, the hardest addiction to escape from because if you uh, suffer from alcohol dependence, for example, you could exclude yourself from pubs and events where they serve alcohol. But with technology and gaming, it's everywhere. It's in your pockets. It's just it's hard mm. to escape. Is there any evidence? That, yes, go for it, Katie. Please at, chime in. At, at the same time, if someone has made a social space mm. and you're at home alone and you're lonely and you want someone to talk to and there's a known space where your friends are and you can go there, you go. And a lot of, um, sorry, I hate to say younger people, but a lot of people don't work standard hours. You know, if you're in, in hospitality, you finish at 3 a.m., you're wide awake and you want to talk to people, you want to debrief. So you go to where your friends are and the outside world isn't necessarily any safer or any better at 3 a.m. than somewhere online where you can have a cup of tea with a friend and completely debrief. So I, again, I think there's really pros and cons. And, and you were talking a lot about the kind of the monetization and the hooks. And I, I think we have to talk about the, the business aspect of games because that has a lot. Once you can make a business of addiction, you've got a guaranteed income. And, and so the social aspect versus the business aspect it's really tricky to navigate, I think. Well, that's a really good point because we've got a, a live stream viewer question here saying what measures can game designers take to help combat game addiction while still encouraging people to play their games? So recognising that line between addiction and in engagement. Dan, do you have some thoughts on that? I'd love to. Like, uh, you know, uh, obviously, um, is my mic on? It is. It is. Yeah, like like the last round of games that we did at Mighty Kingdom were almost all targeted at uh, particularly young girls under the age of 13. And there was never an intent by us nor the brand partners that we were working with to create significant issues for them. There was no design in it that was inherent to that. And if anything, particularly a partner like Lego would avoid it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the industry doesn't like overwhelmingly as developers to do free to play games. They don't. Most, and Katie would say this, most of the students that come out of these programs and most of the people that I work with in, in South Australia and broader Australia would much prefer to do what's called a premium game. And, uh, and you certainly see a lot of that coming out of Melbourne where they've had a really rich history of video game companies going back to the 80s, including Atari, where things like Untitled Goose Game and Florence and some really beautiful games that are about human experience have come out. Obviously, there's always going to be issues with all marketing, purely marketing, that is, to use your term, predatory and sets up a fear of missing out sets up social cues to bring you back into it, all of it. And I think we have to be really careful that, because my 16 year old knows a lot more than me, he does, but he's also autistic. So I recognize his vulnerabilities as well, that may, he may be more comfortable in that social environment, as you say, meeting friends there. He may be much more comfortable interacting with people there because there's common goals, there's a rule set, that's part of the appeal of that structure. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that it's going to lead to his independence and social independence to being more comfortable in his own skin. And the games industry, overwhelmingly the people that work within it, possibly not all of the finance, but the people that work within it would much prefer that latter part, that there be balance. Because to our younger generation, it is fundamentally their culture. You know, If we look at the Nielsen rating system in the US, sorry, as late as August, it's still about half and half in screen time between linear and interactive screen time, and that was around August of 2021. So while that, that hourly content and consumption is going up on games, 
I think it, it, it is still something where the more information we get and the more we work with our kids as I do, I make sure there's computers in the lounge room with me, the more we'll understand what the benefits are and what the positive social behavior is and also to create that balance to make sure they don't slip off that ledge. Because there are a number of different ways around body image and consumption and FOMO, 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 which is how they marketed to kids since the days of Happy Meals, um, that is really negative and le will lead to many negative outcomes. I think uh, one of the questions that a lot of people will be asking is just how big is this going to get? I mean, do we have a crystal ball? Do we have an idea of just what is in store in terms of the development and the spread of gaming and games? It, it is absolutely the largest media slice now. And, and regardless of COVID, it will continue to grow. We, we definitely have, uh, you know, more of a weight towards people under the age of 25 playing games. But as Daniel pointed out, particularly in the mobile market, which is a platform that didn't exist before the iPhone, this is in a completely new spectrum of interaction that we really don't understand. And I, I really support your message of, let's truly understand the issue, how it manifests with more data, better research, um, because this is Pandora, the box is open. We cannot wind back the engagement, especially in a younger generation and also in an older generation. Many men over 60 are turning into video games and strategy games to remain active in their retirement. We can't wind that back and put that back in the box. Let's get some really healthy information out there, objective and ethical information. Industry wants it, industry will respond to it. With Apple, Amazon, Google, these major giants all investing heavily in the video game industry, more so than they invest in traditional linear screen, those ethics will be important to them in years to come and to their shareholders. Katie, do you have a thought on ethics or, or Daniel in that regard? To jump off that point, <clears throat> there was an example of a developer, the developer of Warframe, that introduced microtransactions into their game and then they recognised that there was a player who was spending endlessly, mm. far more than they ever anticipated, hundreds of dollars. And so they realised this could be potentially harmful for that player and they removed that feature from the game. So that's an isolated example of, an, of, a, of a game provider recognising, okay, this, this could actually be an issue for some of our players. We don't know to what extent this sort of self-reflection <laughs> or self-analysis happens. However, mm. many game providers would have access to this sort of information. And I think the future is about marrying the this behaviour tracking data that the industry has access to, looking at the distributions for things like time spent, um, features that are encouraging repetitive actions with um, measures of mental health and problem gaming. And we haven't seen that. One quick note though, obviously under a certain age due to COPA and GDPR, you can actually identify the individual player in much of the data you get back. Yep. And, uh, and I would agree. I think there are a lot of companies out there that don't necessarily want to reinforce uh, that kind of negative behavior, but it's also difficult for them despite the data they get to identify individual players or even people within a certain region. It's overall trends, it's quite coarse at times. Katie. Interesting, our students also see a very um, classist aspect to the loot boxes. If you're rich, you can afford the loot boxes. If you're not rich, you, you can't. They hate that like poison. Uh, they hate microtransactions. They've grown up with microtransactions. So interestingly, the developers are themselves are now at the age where they can subvert the system a little bit because they've been a, a victim to it. Um, their worlds that they love, our artists just want to make beautiful worlds for them and for other to, people to be in. So again, that, that inherent hook, uh, the desire to manipulate, the desire to get that little dopamine pedal hit over and over and over and over and over, um, mm. that's not why they make games and that's not why they want to be in games. So again, it's really the business aspect which comes back to funding. So you've got the Hollywood model where you, far from perfect, okay. but you get funding, you make the film. And then, but with games, because you have so many really small studios, you get all of these people who put all of their time and all of their money into making a game and then, then, they have to pray that they can pay their rent. They have to pray that they can pay their office space. Then comes that, ooh, how do we make money? And that's where you start getting these hooks and these formulas yeah. in. And so 
part of it is a, is a funding issue. And if we can address the funding issue, then we can address the need for microtransactions, maybe overly optimistic. But no, I think I would agree. I think the more diversity in uh, f uh, investment in the industry and the more it diversifies in terms of different business models, the more you'll see most of the monetization and gambling stuff drop out of it. So we've got about 10 minutes to go. Um, if you're um, online, slido.com and the hashtag BraveOct2021 is, uh, is your way of submitting a question. We do have some audience questions and there's one that flows very nicely from that point. Um, an anonymous writer says they find it an issue that schools use games in their learning, such as Prodigy used in maths. So my son come, came home, he's asking for an account that you have to pay for. So this perhaps leads to a further discussion point for, for Daniel or Kim around gaming in yeah. schools. So, so my older brother says to me, Kim, check this game out um, and tells his son who's six years old to show me this game, Prodigy. And it's a mathematics game. And uh, I look over his shoulder and it's an adventure game. It's a, it's a role playing game and you're a wizard and you've, you try to defeat dragons and get pets and it's all fun. And then they ask you mathematical questions to advance into the game. But he wasn't actually reading the actual mathematical answer. He was just clicking whatever answer was first, multiple choice. If it wasn't right, then he clicked the other one and then advanced through. So he wasn't actually really learning about the math um, game. Um, speak to his sister and his sister says um, that children in their class spend a lot of money in order to advance through the game and to be able to buy pets. And um, if you look at websites like Common Sense Media, parents and children alike both complain that the um, advertising of the subscription model is really annoying and they really don't like the game. So is there an issue there if schools are utilising these games for so-called educational purposes, but really what it's doing is creating angst for parents? Is that something that might need to be revisited? Uh, well, I, I think to me it's just a bad educational tool, game or otherwise. And I think increasing the level of intelligence in a school, much like the Victorian Department of Education and ACME have just done, of finding, um, you know, because you know Minecraft has been something that's been substantial, I think quite effective in schools in terms of teaching the basics of creating within a computer, when game or not. You know, the schools need to be able to come up to the point where those digital natives, um, uh, you know, you can identify what is a high quality product and what is a poor quality product, you know. And if I had a lot of bad textbooks back in the day in, in the US, God, I could stack them high and, and sink a ship with them, you know. It's, it's, it's again, it's like, I don't like this idea of saying that it's specific around games because it's new and it's unfamiliar to most of the people that are running larger educational and social work organizations. I think there's a lot of that. I think we really need to get on the inside of the problem and look out in terms of what it actually means to those kids because it is a different world to them and find out what those vulnerable points are and get that research in place. And then make sure that schools know it, you know, and companies know it when they're using training programs. The last deal I did at Mighty Kingdom was a deal with the Red Cross to help 14 year olds understand things, kids under the age of 14 understand things like preparing for pandemics and bushfires. I'm very happy that I did that. It was a good product. So I do have a question here from Nicole and she's actually um, jumped in twice. She's in the school system. So um, noting that, how do you navigate the, the discussion in schools if students are passionate about becoming an influencer or a game tester or a professional gamer. So if this is something that they want to actually develop as a skill or a craft, not necessarily as an addiction, but something that they think is valid for their future lives. Okay, where does that um, leave schools in terms of how they navigate that? Telling the difference between somebody who's seriously gonna make a career out of something like this versus somebody who might be developing a problem. Kate? I think the answer to a lot of this is informed discussion. Get the information out there and talk. Get the school kids talking to each other. Get the teachers not afraid. Uh, teaching people how to debate without fighting mm. increasingly with the internet is something we need to learn to do. Yep. And this is a really good topic because people feel strongly about it. So let people discuss it in a moderated space. And we do this in our class. You know, we, we ask questions, everyone has to research them. We come back and we discuss it. And in a games development topic where people feel really strongly about things, yes. And it leads to these amazing discussions. And then people go away and they think and they go, mm, maybe, you know, it doesn't all happen in the room. People need time to reflect and to think about it. But standing up there and 
you know, saying things are bad. I, I think your balanced discussion is a really good way to approach this. I think actually today's session where you uh, where you laid all of this out, there's the pros and the cons, and we need to teach people to dis to discuss this so that when someone has a problem, they can turn to their friends and say, I've got a problem and have it not be, I'm anti-game, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm anti-social. It's not the medium. We need to discuss this. And that should start in schools and families. And it it's needs to have the information to back it up. And simple answer for people who want their kids to learn STEM, teach them how to make video games. Take it from me. I was very analog until 97, made my first Flash website. And I did it because I wanted to tell a story. I learned how to script and code. Mm -hmm. And through that process, if we're training here, if we're educating people here at the university on game development, is there an ethics component that we need to build in to ensure that that is, uh, you know, part of the consideration of the of the products that ultimately some of our graduates will be going going out and Absolutely. engaging with? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think if you look at the portrayal of uh, gender and race and ethnicity and uh, putting out hate speech and harmful behavior in any form of culture or entertainment. We must treat games as a part of our culture. It is, and we must treat it as respectfully as we do any other medium that we create from this university. I've got uh, <clears throat> two questions here and noting we've only got a few minutes left, about five minutes left. I'd like to bundle them together. There's one from a teacher saying that she's worried that I won't be able to motivate students to take breaks and go outside when gaming is their whole world. But perhaps uh, just as tellingly, we've got a question from somebody here who says, look, as someone who has been addicted to games myself in the past, what can individuals do to help break the addiction? Because it is definitely a hard one to break. So you've got a teacher wanting to assist their students through problems and get them into the real world. You've got somebody who's living a, a lived experience of addiction who wants to know how they can manage that going forward so they don't fall back into those habits. Some thoughts from the panel. Daniel. I mean, this is an issue we have to take seriously. There are people out there who are experiencing very significant issues and we shouldn't talk about those issues and conflate it with careers in gaming or, um, you know, the artistry of games because these are very different issues. They're not related. Um, people who become professional esports players that there's studies that show that they are not like problem gamers, mm -hmm. that, that they, even if they're spending 80 hours a week playing games, which most of them aren't, to be honest, because they're actually, they don't improve by playing more. They improve by um, reviewing how much they play and various other things. They're different. They're fundamentally different. These are fundamentally different issues. So the people with problems, they need to be able to um, take steps to seek help to be able to talk about it for there to for this issue not to be confounded with discussions around you know moral panic and concern we need to just stay calm and listen to people with problems effectively and rely on the professionalism that we have through people like Kim you know people who are actually trained and skilled Kim yeah I mean I've read those esports um, researchers, and um, it comes from South Korea. They scan the brains of StarCraft players and people with the problem, but that's all really old research now. We need people like Daniel to continue to publish current research because this year I've started to treat my first ever esports gamers, and they're getting younger. They're 15, they're earning thousands of dollars, but they collapse, they don't eat enough food, they go to the emergency department, and they still can't see that their lives are so intertwined with the gaming. Not only that, after they play their tournaments, they got to stay up another hour editing, uploading, getting an audience, building an audience. And I'm having these conversations with them about influencers. And, and the thing is, is that with the research on influencers is saying is that they're very personable. They're very charismatic. They're very good at selling you a product. And usually they're promoting a game or a purchase within a game. And I'm having this frank discussion with a young person saying, you're very good at this game, but your personal skills, your teammates have more viewers because they are just more likable. I think you should be doing drama lessons. I think you should be going you know, out and, and learning how to speak in front of a camera, not just playing the game 12 hours a day. 
So we, we are pretty much to time. I would like to give the panel sort of 30 seconds each to have one closing thought. If there's one thought you'd like to leave our listeners and viewers with tonight, um, can you sum it up for me in 30 seconds? And I'll, I'll literally whip through from Dan, Dan, Katie <laughs> and Kim. So Dan, 30 seconds, what's the take home message? Okay, so problem gaming is an issue. I think we need to have a balanced discussion as I've been really impressed with this panel that we have had that tonight. Um, we need to move away from a dialogue of let's be concerned, let's have panic, you know, moral panic discussions around technology, let's throw in all of these other things like esports. Let's talk about the issue as it exists in Australia and start taking practical steps in policy, in research and interventions. Dan. Talk to your kids. They're scared. They're being told that the earth will end within a generation. They don't want to have children. There are multiple issues around, you know, nationalism and just there's so much polarized anger, fear and anxiety. And it's really dumping hard on Generation Z. Talk to your kids, get good information, get real research, get them help. But don't demonize any part of their life until you genuinely understand and talk to them about it. Katie, your thoughts? Uh, more funding for mental health. This is a mental health issue, one of many. Funding is simply not there. So even if people are struggling, how do they get help? Give teachers tools to guide discussions. Um, if a teacher is too scared to teach math, they're probably too scared to have a discussion like this. So we need to give them tools for discussion and we need to get funding for the industry and we need to get funding for help. Kim, the final word. If you need help, seek support and support people like Dan who are producing world-class research. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd ask you to please thank our esteemed panellists tonight, Daniel, Dan, Katie and Kim for sharing their insights with us with a small round of applause. So thank you so much. Um, I would also like to thank our audience for their questions, the input and the interest that you've shown in this event. And finally, I'd like to once again acknowledge Bank SA for supporting this Brave Lecture series. So remember, you can watch this series again on Flinders' YouTube channel or our Brave webpage, where you can also register to receive updates and notifications about future events. Our next Brave Lecture will take place on November 23, also at 6pm. It features Associate Professor Justin Chalker, who will discuss new frontiers in sulfur chemistry. We hope you can join us. So thank you once again and good evening. <laughs>